Captain's Log. Today we've... Actually, no, we're not going to do that kind of intro. Uh, today, though, I do have a question of the day for you. What is your favorite solo game and why? Now, here's the thing. When I think of solo games, I usually think of small box games, usually card games, right? That are, you know, you kind of play them, put these cards in your hand, and maybe that's just the ones that I've played. But when I think of solo games, I don't think of huge big box production games like Nemo's War. Now, yes, there are variants in the end of this. And to hear me say variants that allow you to play this cooperative or semi-competitive, but the game is made to be played solo. That's what it says. And it is a highly immersive experience all about playing as Captain Nemo from the Jules Verne uh, story about 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. You're sailing across the world, you're defeating ships, you're trying to score points and see wonders depending on the type of um, goal that you have. You score more points or less points for doing certain things. It's a really interesting combination of games with a very high production quality from Victory Point Games, Arts by Ian O'Toole, Chris Taylor designed it. Um, let's take a look at what Nemo's War is and tell me in the comments below what is your favorite solo game and why. And because there are a lot of times, let me just diatribe for a second, there are a lot of times when I play a solo game when I'm sitting there and the room is just silent and it's just me inside my head. And it's weird, right? Also, these bigger games like this, like I play Gloomhaven solo, even though it's not meant to be a solo game completely, this is meant to be solo. Um, and there'll be a lot of times where I'm more lax on the whole, like, mm, I didn't mean to do that. I meant to do this instead. So uh, let me know in the comments below kind of your discipline rules, how you discipline yourself in a solo game. Obviously, some of you are going to say, well, just follow the rules, Brian. I get that. Yes, I understand. But I mean, it is a game after all, and I'm the only one playing. So let me know your favorite solo games in the comments below. Right now, we're going to look at how to play Nemo's War. We'll come back up and talk about what we think about this game right now. So this sprawling game right here is Nemo's War. Now the interesting thing about Nemo's War, it is primarily a single player game. As the instructions say, there's a lot to this game though. So if you're a solo gamer, uh, there's a lot to this and you can get into it pretty deep. You're playing as Captain Nemo, obviously the character from 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea by Jules Verne. You've got a little Nautilus that you are in control of. You're going around the world, different oceans, and you're fighting you know, hidden ships that turn out to be different types of battleships and frigates, etc. You're going around collecting treasure from these places. All of these little places with the treasure tokens on them have treasure that you can go ahead and search now, but you can also add treasure. You also can go adventuring in this deck up here, which is basically cards that were not put into our story deck over here. That's where you track your notoriety on the board to see how you know, famous or infamous, or infamous, as they say, uh, your character might be, or you might be. Your crew is down here. You can sacrifice these crew at any time. Yeah, I know. Good captain, right? To so get the bonus aff affiliated with it. You also start with one upgrade to your Nautilus, but there are other ones over here that you can purchase. There are still some that are sitting over there in the box that we don't use. You only use a certain amount. But then you have the adventure deck over here, the event deck. And this is kind of the main timer of the game, other than just losing uh, pandemic style a couple of different ways. But this adventure deck is seated with a prologue card, a, an act one, an act two, and an act three card, as well as a finale. And basically, you're going to be trying to score points based on your motive. Now, over here, my motive is ex explore. There are two, four different ones. So there's explore, there's anti-imperialism, there's uh, science, and I believe there's, what's the other one? science, and then war. So they change the way you play the game. So essentially you don't have to play the game the same every time. This one is all about exploring and trying to see wonders. Now you'll notice that the scoring changes based on what you do in the game. So as this goal, I lose a point for each sunken warship I have. No extra points for the, um, I should say it's minus one for each sunken warship. No extra points for non-warship sunk. Adventure cards are no extra points, plus one for each treasure multiply my amount of points by for liberation points uh, science discovered is times four and then wonder seen is times seven now, if you move this across you'll see that each of these change so there's the science numbers right there what they would be if you played the science version there's the explorer version that's what i have uh, the anti-imperialism and then of course the war ones so they change based on how you're playing the game so it's really interesting 
to see that. And you'll keep track of the types of points that you have up here with these different scoring tokens. Uh, almost feels like a GMT game there, but then at the end of the game, you'll multiply it out, checking yourself against a scoring matrix and seeing if you succeeded, if you failed. Uh, and then you can come over here to this neat little epilogue book and check your type of motive and see if you failed or succeeded. Basically, this is just a way to show off some Eno tool art with some cool things at the bottom. It doesn't really, it's not really a story thing, but there's a lot of really cool things in this book. Just, it looks good, plus a little bit of rule clarification on the back. Now, the way this works is three phases, much like a lot of games, but the three phases are pretty simple. There's the event phase. Basically, you're gonna come over here, you're gonna open up this, turn over the top card. You'll read this, first of all, and then you will do the next card. Now these are shuffled in certain types of events. I'll show you this one. This is a keep event. Normally you would play them or test them immediately, but this says when in the Indian Ocean for one action you may test. You'll roll the two white dice if you were over here in the Indian Ocean. If you have a 10 or above, or if you use some of these little uh, perks to can spin, would be risking your crew, yourself, or your hull, you can get an additional damage or dice modifiers. Now this one says, if you do this, you pass and collect three treasure, which treasure basically give you different types of points that you saw over there, collectibles, and you put it in your pass section of the board. The pass section of the board is where you are going to get uh, your points from most likely at the end of the game, because it says, if pass, you know, get these points. But you'll do your card first, and then you're gonna take the placement phase, which means you take these two white dice that you start the game with, and that will change later on. You roll it and then you see the difference first of all so four minus one is three that means we get three action points you can never get more than five one two three you start with two based on that prologue card so we now have five action points for the turn to spend our actions but you also will place new ships out now this is where the pandemic style kind of sinks in so that one is one we'll put a hidden ship on one and a hidden ship over here on four had there not been space for that you'll follow these rules. You'll place a hidden ship first, then a hidden ship in an adjacent ocean. So follow those blue lines. If you can't do that, you'll have to flip open a non-warship, which means take one of the ships with the white side face up. If you can't do that, because they're all flipped, you'll start flipping over warships to their, or non-warships to their warship side. And if you can't do that, if every single space on the board is full, you will lose the game. That's one of the ways to lose the game. So let's talk about the actions you can do on your turn. First, you can adventure, which means you'll go over here to these extra cards from the event deck you will take the option, do it. Uh, if you resolve it, you'll also take as many treasure tokens as there are up here uh, on this pile on top of the deck, discard those, grab the treasure, but also gain the rewards from this adventure card. So it's just another way to kind of burn through some of those cards that you weren't picked. You can attack the ships, and basically that's actually, what's really great is all the rules of the game are basically printed here on the board. There's the combat sequence. They attack you first if they're in a warship, if they're not you attack them. If you succeed, you sink them and they can either go down into uh, to the tonnage track, which is how you essentially, I'll show you. Let's say I sunk three ships in the Western Pacific and technically you can combo that if you do the bold attack. If you do a bold attack, you can keep attacking until you decide to either salvage, which we'll talk about in a second, or stop. But each time you attack someone and sink them, you build up this track in that location to where at the end of the game, you're gonna get 17 points if you stopped here in the Western Pacific. But you can keep going. These could be 40 points. You could be the scourge of the Western Pacific. This is actually supposed to be here right now. But you can also put them over here in the salvage track. Now the salvage track allows you to buy more of these upgrades later. So you can either salvage it for parts or use it for victory points. Now alone, they're not worth a ton of victory points, you'll notice. But once they're down here stacking up, you can get a lot of victory points out of them. So that's attacking. And there's a few little more intricate rules when it comes to attacking, whether you're gonna stealth attack or not. You can always spend a half a point or exert. This is a bet. You exert one of these three things. Usually on a test, it'll tell you one of the three to do. Or if it's a fight, you can exert uh, the hull, etc. And you bet it. If you succeed, you scoot it back over here to the left. If you fail that test, you scoot over here to the right. You notice the points decrease on these tracks depending on where you end the game with. So it is a neat little gambling thing where you're betting, oh man, I hope I can do this. Now, you can also incite, which means you're going to place a cube and you roll the dice. Check this chart over here. So these are this is actually the chart for all the different actions that you roll against. The incite. Check our, our numbers is a nine. So you check up here in the nine track. You place an uprising cube and you lose a notoriety, which is great because your notoriety track is another way to lose. 
Another way to lose is if these tracks get all the way to the end of one of them, or if your notoriety track gets to the end. But the notoriety track also makes it more difficult as stronger ships get sent into the ship pool if you're not careful, if that goes up too fast. The different difficulties of the game are also where you put it. So I've got them set for sailor right now, but normally you'd be an officer, which is where you'd set them here and here. But the other actions you can do would be to, so in sight, you put these cubes out here, and basically these are showing that you're helping the locals uh, in that area up in sight against the colonialist area or the imperialist there. Uh, these will can get removed if you roll doubles, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit. But you can also move one space normally, but our upgrade is the hydro drive, which means we can move two spaces. You can move for an action point, and the action points are listed to the side of them, how much they cost. You can move, you can rest to regain the crew, which is basically the ones you can spend down here to use to get their victory points or their bonuses. They're worth the points at the end of the game if you have them. If you, ca if you cash them in, they're worth that, basically. So, um, you can rest to regain the crew, you can repair to regain hold. Now sometimes, and that's scooting this number back, sometimes you'll gain an event that says you have to repair to you know, fix that event, so it's kind of a waste to repair them. Refit, this is where you buy parts over here based on the cost on the top right. You can use salvage parts to buy those, which is pretty neat. So you're going to want to salvage those so that you can buy these parts here. And there are different things that upgrade your Nautilus. Things like um, steam torpedoes, you can shoot those monstrous design. You gain a fewer, uh, not a, a fewer uh, notoriety point uh, when you do that. And then last but not least is search for treasure. That's when you're in one of these spaces with the treasure available markers. You roll against the chart. Check the chart, so we have eight there. Search is eight. We do collect a notoriety, but we then reach up here and grab a token. Game ends with one of those defeat things that we see on the board printed in red, or when you hit the finale card down here, and there are multiple finales depending on which one you choose. It's in the bottom uh, fifth of the deck. So that's how you play Nemo's War. It's a very, very straightforward game. Everything's printed on the board here for you how to play, but deep first one player, uh, adventure game all about swimming or you know sailing across the world collecting points and hoping that you can come out against that chart as good as you can so that's Nemo's War very interesting game right it's got a lot of fantastic mechanics I kept saying in the overview it's got some pandemic elements but you don't, I only say that because there is a map where things get on the board really that's that's the only reason because you don't just go there and do an action you have to go there and defeat these ships to get them off the board uh, but the good news is defeating ships is not just a useless thing that is a time waster of your action points. Defeating ships is actually something that will score you a fairly good bit of points, especially if you're doing bold attacks in the same ocean. and Because then you're stacking those up across there and you can become the scourge of the, the Indian Ocean or whatever. And you've got, you know, 40 points for that. That's a really good thing. But... Um, as far as let's let's break this down like we typically do as far as the art itself Ian O'Toole did a fantastic job on making this game look good it looks like something a captain would have on their desk in their office or their quarters in a ship right it looks like that and that to me looks really interesting I love the fact that you're looking down like you're making all these captains decisions etc so very well done on the art it looks good um now, there are a couple things that are interesting because some of the tokens feel a little bit like a GMT game. Uh, take that or leave that how you want it, but they're, they're just kind of strange in that sense. But I do like the fact that you reach over and grab a treasure token, and you get a treasure token. It tells you what kind of point to give yourself, and you give yourself those points. It's just interesting. Now, it says if you're doing the... Um, you know the kind of victory point scoring where you're keeping track during the game i definitely recommend that method i know some people would rather be surprised at the end but i recommend the method of okay i just scored another wonder which means i get seven times seven uh you know seven times four if i've got four wonders uh, on the explore one so as far as art and presentation the game looks good the nautilus piece is nice uh the map looks really cool i like the way everything sits on the board i like that everything's got a spot i like that almost every single rule has a reference of some sort on the map. That is so helpful in a solo game where you don't feel like just flipping and pawing through the rules. That is a really, 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 really good idea when you have a solo game like that where you can afford the board space and you can afford board orientation facing one player to have those rules sitting there spelled out, um, referenced in multiple places. You know, Whether it be the chart in the bottom left, I love that I don't have to flip to the back of a book to see what I get for the chart. Uh, whether it be the, the references for the turn order, references for fighting, references for things like that. I love how smooth that all is handled with just the art and presentation. So well done there. Now as far as the game itself, as far as playing the mechanics of the game, 
Um, I like the fact that it's just three phases. You flip over that top card, you read it, you do the event, you then roll the dice. This is the only wonky part because this is where it kind of gets very difficult is that differential dice. Getting the differential is very tough sometimes when you only have one action point or you only have zero action points left over and you roll that and you roll a four and a three and it's like, ugh, so you're getting, you know, one action point, uh, which is which is a pain, but, you know, there are a lot of actions that only cost one. Um, so, but even the actions aren't the main focus of the game. Yes, they are important, but it's kind of more the experience of, you know, getting the points off the event cards, which you can do with or without action points, you know, positioning yourself for later turns. And then, of course, the placement of ships. You know, I like that, how you roll those same dice and the dice that you roll to get your differential number to tell you how many action points you have are where you put new ships on the board. The fighting mechanic is cool. The explore mechanic is neat. Uh, the, the search action is great where you can you can search there for treasure, um, but, you know, roll the dice and if you check it against this chart. So it almost feels like more of a solo RPG experience than anything because it's got that chart. You know, it's if you've ever played... Uh, uh, an RPG before and you're the keeper or the GM or something like that you have charts to look at based on dice rolls and that's really what this feels like um, as far as the other things you can do like adventuring so you take the cards that weren't put in your deck and they're still available to you in the game you can go adventure for other event cards I think that's really cool because event cards are very powerful sometimes and sometimes they suck they're really a pain but um, in this case it's just interesting that it's there. I like the refit, that you can refit and repair and do all these things with your ship. It's just really nice. You get so many options, so many choices, so many things to do and think about while playing that it's such a good solo experience. It's, it's one of the best solo games I've ever played. And what's interesting about it is it's not a solo, uh, it's not a single person count version of a bigger game. Now, this is a solo game that tacks on a variant where you can add people at the end, but... I love how well thought out that is of saying, hey, you know, we're going to take this risk. We're going to throw Nemo's Ward out there. It's a solo game, um, and we're going to make it. And hopefully, you know, hopefully it does well, blah, blah, blah. But it's really well done. I really think you should check out Nemo's Ward. And there's never been a better time in history than right now to pick up a game like this. Go check it out. The theme is fun. You know, you're, you're, you're doing all the insight cubes, and you're, you're causing rise-ups. But even the fact that there are four different goal types to go after changes the way you play this game every single time. You can't get locked into a strategy if you choose a different or even a random one of these um, goal type or motive cards. I think that's such a smart idea that the points change based on what you do depending on what your motive is. So all that to say, I really enjoyed Nemo's War. This is a fantastically cool game that you definitely need to go check out. Now, I'm Brian Drake here on the Dice Tower. Make sure to follow us on Twitter, Instagram, etc. at Dice Tower Brian. Until next time, we'll see you.